Dear listener, what I'm about to tell you is the real-life experience that I had the evening of March 24th, 2024. I'm writing this down and recording it the night of because I don't want to let a detail slip from my mind. It truly feels like eternal souls are dependent upon it. Tonight, I went for the very first time to a Kingdom's Hall, Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses for a Memorial of Jesus' death service. It's not the first time I've been invited by any means, but the whole ordeal has been both eye-opening and heartbreaking all at the same time. Some background on me. My name is Tyler Williams. I have been a Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian for most of my life, saved at age seven in vacation Bible school, in the faith up through most of my life, even if not fully practicing. In 2016, I fully rededicated my life to Christ. And since 2021, I've been preaching sermons and have been ordained to preach since 2022. Currently, I'm the pastor at a small Baptist church in Danville, Virginia called Bethlehem Baptist Church. I adhere to the five points of the doctrines of grace, or as some call them Calvinism. I also adhere to the five points of the Protestant Reformation, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. I spent most of my Christian life not strong enough to be a witness, nor to give a defense for my faith adequately. Christian apologetics is not something I was familiar with until probably about the past five years. Apologetics has completely changed my outlook on faith. I have finally began to search the Bible deep and wide for the reasons for the truths that I hold dear to. The work of men like James White, Vody Bauckham, Bobby Conway, Dr. Walter Martin, and John MacArthur has made me use the Word of God to strengthen my faith by being ready to give a defense for my faith. That leads me all up to the events of tonight. I know a lot of Christians will probably hear that me as a Bible-believing Christian, the fact that I even went to a kingdom hall and will think I'm either crazy, foolish, or sinful. I honestly went so that I could get a grip and learn what they believe and why they believe it so that I could be a better prepared witness to witness to them and also to protect my own people from falling into their traps. If you disagree with me, I get it. I don't blame you. If you're upset already, then I suggest you turn this off. But this is what I learned, and I want to share it so that maybe you too can be a better prepared witness for your next encounter, or maybe your first encounter, with a Jehovah's Witness to come. My invitation came through the mail. I guess they're still not going door to door as much as they used to since COVID. Nevertheless, the letter stated, Hello, neighbor. Once a year, Jehovah's Witnesses commemorate the death of Jesus just as he commanded when he said, Keep doing this in remembrance of me. Read Luke twenty two nineteen. We hope you and your family will attend. Then the, ad, then the letter gave a date, March 24th, the time and the address for the local Kingdom Hall. It also listed the names of a husband and wife who I assumed wrote my letter, who sent it and even included their phone number should I want more information. I initially replied back politely with a handwritten letter of my own, stating that there was no need to celebrate the death of Jesus because he is alive. He's resurrected on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And I proceeded to flood the letter with scripture references that state Jesus was seen by multiple witnesses, the disciples, the women, and many more before he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1. I doubt my letter will actually have been read, but just in writing it, it helped me build up my own strength. I mulled over what to do, but decided kind of last minute that I wanted to go to the meeting and just see what the whole deal was. Leaving my house, I'll admit, I was already a bit nervous. I've never been actively in a place that was going to be filled with so many people that I knew were going to claim to worship God, yet deny the resurrection of my Lord and Savior, Jesus. This is actively hostile territory for a Christian, which by definition is a follower of Christ. I prayed on the drive and again as I pulled up to park. I was 15 minutes early and the place was already packed. Everyone was dressed to the nines except for me and a select few others. It was easy to tell who was a visitor. I was just in a polo with jeans and some sneakers on. 
while most of the men there were in suits and ladies were in dresses. My hand was shaking about 50 times as I was passing through the lobby, and introductions were made by almost every person I walked by on the inside. If I made eye contact, eye contact with them, we were probably going to exchange names, though. Frankly, I don't remember a soul's name that was there. One witness even took me in to help me find a seat, asking me if I lived nearby and reminding me that if I had any questions, he'd be glad to help. The guy seemed nice enough. I sat in a third row seat from the front with Jehovah's Witnesses on either side. I was the only witness, I was the only non witness in my row. Both of them were super sweet and kind ladies who spoke kindly to me and asked what felt like genuine questions about myself and expressing how glad they were that I was there. I genuinely felt welcomed, and it made me feel even a bit more nervous feeling that welcomed. The room was filled with people. The only thing not in the room was the cross. Since Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus died on a stake and not crucified on a cross, there are no reason for any crosses to be in the room, and certainly no one is wearing one around their neck. Side note, 1 Corinthians one eighteen tells us, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. The Greek word used for cross is storos, the Roman, the Roman used instrument for crucifixion, literally the cross being placed at the top of the vertical member to form what looks like a capital T. Nevertheless, the service begins and a song is sung to start us off claiming that this song is from 1 Peter 2, 9, which reads, But you are a chosen family, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I've read this scripture 10 million times, and I know this scripture is referring to New Testament Christians as a whole. But the words of the song have admittedly been twisted into praising the organization that is Jehovah's Witnesses. I say organization because they are not to be considered a denomination of Christianity. They wouldn't claim that anyway. They believe that only Jehovah's Witnesses are true followers of God, while we, Orthodox Christians, are perceived as being polytheistic worshipers of multiple gods. Nevertheless, a lot of emphasis is put on the organization, not the New Testament church as a whole. After all, there is no one in this place who even has a Bible that looks anything like mine at home. All their books are the same color. Their Bibles, that is. They're silver. When I say silver, it is the color of the 2013 revision of the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. This is the only Bible that Jehovah's Witnesses use. They don't recognize other translations because according to them, our translations are not trustworthy nor truthful. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has produced this translation, and by God, it's the only one they're going to use. Side note. If you have the Bible app on your phone, or if you use websites like Bible Gateway or Blue Letter Bible, you'll quickly notice that in no way, shape, or form does any serious Christian bookstore or Christian resource have copies of the New World Translation on it. That's because Hebrew and Greek scholars have vastly concluded that this translation is not only done in error and with intentionally faulty translations of the original languages into English, but it is done so to remove the elements such as the deity of Christ. But that's the only book that's in the building, silver copies of this New World Translation. But I digress. Back to the evening. Emphasis is put on the organization. Numbers are thrown out left and right by the man standing at the front of the building of just how many people Jehovah's Witnesses have had visit, especially during this time when they invite the outside world in to recruit. Nevertheless, the lesson begins with three main points by the speaker. How does Jesus' death open the way to eternity? Who should partake of the Lord's Supper? And what can we do to show appreciation to Jehovah God? That name Jehovah gets used a lot here, obviously by the name of the organization. It is the way they choose to refer to God the Father. You'll never hear the word Yahweh or Elohim or Adonai uttered in this place. 
The speaker proceeds to speak of two great things that we would actually agree with, that sin entered the world through Adam and that mankind is inherently sinful because of that. As time goes on, though, and scripture and scripture is being read, I begin to notice a pattern. We're talking a lot about Jesus and his death, but we're never mentioning the word grace, nor are we mentioning anything close to grace through faith in Christ. Most of what is being taught is that any hope there is to have is only in obedience. They're quoting Romans chapter 5, verse 19, which in their translation says, For just as through the disobedience of the one many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one person many will be made righteous. Did you catch that word in there? One person. It's a slight dig at the deity of Christ, referring to Jesus as if he is just a person. Here's Romans chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, properly translated. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were appointed sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be appointed righteous. When you hold them up close together, you, begin, you can begin to see the discrepancies in the translations. All the things I've always heard about Jehovah's Witnesses being a Works-based salvation are starting to make sense. The theme of obedience is repeated subtly enough through the message that if you don't know better, you'd probably catch yourself nodding right along with it. It sounds right on a human level. Scripture is being read to support it, but I'm on high enough alert to know that I'm not hearing any grace nor faith being taught. It's all obedience. But we continue. Then at the point, this point of the meeting, we get to the big flash point, something I've always heard about Jehovah's Witnesses. The topic of the 144,000 comes up in the message. This number is a big part of Jehovah's Witnesses' doctrine. It's taken from Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that, the only, that only the 144,000 mentioned will go to heaven. The speaker calls them purchased and bought from mankind that only they will go to heaven. The rest of us can only hope to be a part of what is referred to as paradise earth, where apparently, according to him, homes will be built without consequence and vineyards will be planted to grow fruit. They get to this point by quoting from Isaiah chapter 65, verses 21 and 22, which gives a depiction or a description of the new heavens and new earth. However, these are not for Jehovah's Witnesses. A little reading of a true translation shows that these verses are describing the future blessings of faithful Israel in the future kingdom, which is a part of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ at his second advent. Not Jehovah's Witnesses, because they do not count Jesus as their Lord and Savior. At most, Jesus is simply God's Son who died for their sins, but he is not the one to worship or place faith in. That honor, on this night, is reserved for Jehovah God, the Father only. Side note, rebuttal. John fourteen six. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. 1 John five twenty also states, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Jesus is, in fact, Lord. You can see that from this plain scripture you've probably been taught most of your life. This is not coming up in the meeting, obviously. In the message, we get to Jesus again. There's no denial that Jesus performed miracles and healed the sick and even resurrected the dead back to life. But it's becoming clear through the message that Jesus' ability to do these things is attributed to his obedience to the Father. We know as Christians from John chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 that Jesus was not just some good man who was made God because 
he had always been God from the beginning with the Father. We know John 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Pretty simple Bible, Bible fact, Bible piece of Scripture to refute this claim. Then comes another part of the service that I know is coming, the communion. The typical elements of wine and bread are presented to the congregation. But the question is asked, who can partake by the speaker? Well, now we've hit another roadblock. Typically in a Christian church, we would say that those who are of faith would take part. But in this kingdom hall of Jehovah's Witnesses, those who have earthly hope, quote unquote, that are not among the 144,000 cannot partake. Only the 144,000 can partake in this communion. Which begs the question, how are any of us sitting there supposed to know who's in and who's out? It is explained along the way of, if you know, you know. I can't make this part up. Really, no one sitting there actually knows who can take the wine and bread. So therefore, in a strange act that you have to see to believe, the wine and the bread are passed down the aisles and not a soul partakes. Because we have no assurance or idea of knowing who is worthy. Side note rebuttal. John 3.16 tells us that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him, Christ, not up to a certain number taken out of context in Revelation. John 3.36, Jesus says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Again, there is no fixed number given by Christ, just he who believes. And again in John 11.25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. No fixed number is given by Christ. It is simply he who believes. And then at the end, we are asked by the speaker, what else can I do? To which the answer is given, give honor by faithfully attending regular meetings at the Kingdom Hall. This is where it all really comes to a head for me as I sit there taking about my third page of notes. For years, I admit I have mocked and downright had a disdain for Jehovah's Witnesses. That has all been changed. I feel sorry for them. I feel terrible for their people that are sitting beside me. On the way home, I could, I could almost cry as I drive home thinking about their eternal souls because they have been tricked. They've been tricked into buying into an organization that gives them zero assurance of salvation from any kind of eternal damnation, which is quite ironic because their doctrine actually denies the existence of a literal hell of fire. Meanwhile, Matthew twenty five forty one, Revelation 1, 17 through 18, Revelation 20, verse 10, Revelation 20, verses 14 through 15, and Revelation 21, verse 8 would say otherwise. But then again, it's not just Jehovah's Witnesses who are now denying a literal hell. Liberal evangelicals are being deceived of this false teaching as well, but that's beside the point. These people, though as nice and as loyal and as helpful as can be, are headed for destruction on the day of judgment. They have no assurance of salvation because they don't believe in Jesus as God the Son. They believe he died, and they believe that he was good, but they don't bear witness of his resurrection. They deny the truth of Luke 24, 36, that Jesus stood before his disciples, showing them his hands and his feet that still had the wounds of his crucifixion. They have no way of knowing for sure if they're even in their 144,000 number. So at best, all they can do is hope for mercy and base that mercy on the faithful attendance and dedication to the teachings of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society through their local kingdom hall. That's why Jehovah's Witnesses send you letters. That's why they show up on your doorstep. They are trying to earn their way into God's grace. We know the truth that grace is not earned. If it was, it wouldn't be grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 reminds us, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, 
not of works, so that no one may boast. When we see them either on our doorstep or recruiting at local events, we need to be loving and caring enough to do more than just slam a door in their face or bless them out. But we need to be armed with the truth to witness to them. Most likely, most of them don't know why they believe what they believe. They're simply repeating what the watchtower has told them. But how do they keep getting people? It's amazing how much they recruit. I was amazed myself at the crowd gathered at this little kingdom hall. It's quite simple. They sound close enough to Christianity, and they use enough common terms that we share to trick weak believers into their false doctrine. This happens because a whole lot of self-professed Christians either A, don't actually read or study their Bible enough to know why they believe what they believe, or B, the Bible that they own, they cannot even read it or understand it at all. There's a good chance they don't actually understand what it's saying. And the other way is that they are a true community of people who, even though they're deceived by Satan and his demons, they've got enough smiles on their faces and kindness to show that they'll make anyone feel welcome as long as they buy in to this doctrine that has been prescribed by the Watchtower. Why do I share all this? Because I'm tired of being the kind of Christian that won't witness to a Jehovah's Witness because it's inconvenient. And I'm also tired of being a Christian who is tricked into believing that the only Bible that belongs in my hands is one that I can't even read myself. Because if I can't read it, then I can't learn it. And if I can't learn it, I can't defend it. And if I can't defend it, then I am as likely to fall into any one of these traps laid by the enemy of my soul that guarantees only a one-way ticket to either apostasy or false teaching on Christ. Both have the same ending in eternal damnation. What I would say is this. Pray for these people. And do more than just pray. Prepare to witness to them in Jesus' name. Speak to them as if you're talking to a loved one or a friend you're having to confront. When you have to confront someone you love, you, you do it in a loving way, but you also have to do it in a firm way, according to the truth. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 tells us to walk in wisdom toward outsiders, redeeming the time. Let your words always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should answer each person. That's my story. I humbly thank you for listening to this, and I pray that some part of this will help make you a better witness to not just Jehovah's Witnesses, but anyone who tries to deny the deity of Christ or that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. God bless.